Hello and welcome to the A-Form show. My name is Alan George and thank you very much for tuning in. Each week we sit across from thought leaders and change makers in the architecture and design space of the GCC. We dive deep into their experiences both professionally and personally and share their valuable insight as to what makes them tick. Our goal is to add value to your day and help you navigate your own personal creative journey. Finally, the opinions and the views of the guest speakers are that of their own. They do not necessarily represent the views and the opinions of the show or the host. Welcome to the show everyone. On today's show we have a very special guest for me. This is someone who I have wanted to have for uh for the last 8 years, 10 years, I can't even tell now, but you'll soon understand why. With close to two decades of award-winning work, we are joined today by Ralph Steinhauer. He is a truly seasoned professional and has been responsible for delivering many key landmarks in the region. Ralph believes in a holistic approach to design and is known for being the vertex of the design studio, project site and academia. You will soon find out why. Apart from his time at RSP, Ralph also is a guest professor at my alma mater, Canadian University of Dubai. So without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome to the show, Ralph. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. So I was thinking, what should be the first question for this interview, seeing as to how we have a bit of history? A good one, I would say. You kind of enlightened me about what the real world of architecture is. So I kind of want to start off with the real world per se. So it's now 2021. It's almost been a year, if not exactly, since COVID kind of came into our lives. From the profession point of view, do you think we have sort of, you know, gone over the hump yet or are we still figuring it out? Have we figured it out and now know what we need to do? I think we are not over the hump yet. I think we started to figure it out a little bit better than a year ago. I think it did take everybody by surprise. I think nobody really thought that it would be a global issue. I thought it was something that was more or less what we had with previous localized epidemic of viruses in Southeast Asia but I think nobody realized how connected the world is these days and how quickly it spread. I think for us it was a really remarkable transition because I remember coming back from my last trip that I took to Riyadh in end of February almost a year ago and I came back we had a directors meeting in RSP and we sat down and I told them I think we need to do a trial run uh, it could be very well that the country is locked down very soon and we need to figure out how we can continue to work with our service our clients and do our job so we sat down and we talked to the IT guy and he said I'm ready when do you want to start a trial and I said let's do it on Thursday so everybody packed up their computers we went home Saturday morning we had our first teams call i think out of roughly 60 people we had a few glitches with wifi connections few software issues by sunday morning everything was resolved and uh, we never came back and that's was, a, i mean that's a pretty good number i mean out of 60 people to kind of so easily transition i, I think i didn't even good. think it was possible and the it guy said you know everything is cloud based bim whatever we do a server we can easily access it's it's remarkable the amount of money we had invested over the last 5 years into it infrastructure it's it's something that you never appreciate until you really need it and right. i think this is something that was astonishing and very positive i think one of the most positive outcomes of this is that people not necessarily have to commute for 3 4 hours a day from Sharjah to Marina and back and lose a lot of daytime just sitting in the car i think that works quite well and i have to be very honest throughout my years of travel i always admired people sitting at the beach with a laptop and doing their work and i always thought why am i not in a profession where we can do this right and i think i could actually do part of my job from the beach and i think this has shown it that it's not necessarily important to be all the time together right i think certain things will be easier when you are in a group around a table and you sketch and you discuss and you brainstorm and the creative process might be sparked a little bit more when you're together around the table but then again with modern technology you can mark up on the screen live where a person talks so i think all of this is there i think we just need to get used to it and so i think from that perspective we have figured it out a little bit but from a business perspective i think that last year was shock everybody was shocked everybody was 
in survival mode. And I think that there are at least a few glimpses at the end of the tunnel. There seems to be a little bit of movement, but the confidence is not back. And I think this is, for this part of the world, the most important thing is that the confidence is there, that people start investing again and that projects resume or get started. Right. And I think that there is a bit of movement. There's a bit of talk and chatter, but it's not enough yet to get this year where it needs to be. Where it needs to be. And I think, you know, unfortunately, I, I, I think our industry will not be spared by a lot of businesses closing. And I think that if this year doesn't pick up, I think that many businesses will have to reconsider. Is it worth being here in the region if it's a global practice or if it's right. a local practice? Can we sustain this? And right. I know that a lot of people lost their job last year and it's it's a real tragedy. And it's a different tragedy than 2008, 2009 when the financial crisis hit. It was a tsunami that I think everybody saw coming, but nobody wanted to admit that it was coming. Right. I mean, you know, Lehman Brothers collapsed and everybody was like, we don't care. But if you really think about how the financial like, yeah, institutions like the of life are connected, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was, I think it was quite naive not to think that it would hit Dubai. And I think it took 2009 to 2013 almost for the city and the economy in the construction industry to recover. Right. And so it will be interesting to see how long the recovery will take for this. And the thing is, you know, we haven't gotten over COVID. It's still there. And I mean, we're starting now a, a massive immunization program and vaccination. And I think this is at least some hope that will contain it, but right. it's not going to go away. I think this is what all the experts say. I'm not an expert, but that's what I'm reading. And I think we have to live with it and we have to live with the outcome for a while. And then the question is it are we going back to normal are we going back to what we have done before and i think we should learn from what happened and i think we should do a few things definitely smarter you know i don't need to fly for every meeting 45 minutes through the gcc for a presentation i right. think we learned now we can do this by right. zoom and it works and the quality is good and everybody now had a bit of exposure to it and it, it's okay so i think that works and I think also that not everybody has to, in the, has to be in the office all the time. And right. I think that's really something that is a positive outcome of. And I, I always look at Europe being European and I always look at Scandinavia because I think they're really at the forefront of work-life balance and protection of people at the workplace. And I think that we should really try to bring more of these ideas over here. I wouldn't mind a four-day work week. I think that is something we should start seriously discussing when we think about work-life balance. Right. And there is actually a um, practice that does a four-day work week here, small little boutique. And of course, we were all really interested to know what the results were from a operation point of view, efficiencies and things like that. Surprisingly, efficiency actually increased. People became a lot more cognizant of the time that they have. And everyone enjoyed a three day, you know, sort of weekend um, every week. So yes, it does work. And I think it's just a matter of someone actually doing it and someone actually saying that it works. That's that's kind of all that we need. I'm pretty sure like myself, if someone probably told you as well, maybe five years back, saying, listen, Ralph, we can take RSP completely online. You'd be a little skeptical too. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Yeah. So I kind of want to maybe dial back because this is a question I ask a lot of the people on the show I tend to be from boutique firms and so on. But Someone like RSP, at the scale that you are at with COVID, in this year, have you had to sort of change your business model in any way? Sort of, you know, target a different sector or, you know, double down on something else, lay off something else that way? Mm, we didn't really change the business model. I think okay. that the way that we're set up is that we're not specialized only in one discipline or in one sector. I think we have quite a wide range of talents and we have a very wide range of projects. So I think that this is something that we didn't consider. Now we have to target something specifically to, to keep going. I think we were in a very lucky position that we still had a lot of people on site. I think from a cash flow perspective, this is something that really helped the business yep. because some of our projects did go on hold, right. understandably. And so I think that was something that helped us. But in terms of 
changing the business model, I don't really think we had to do that. Okay. All right. Yeah, that was quite a common thing for a lot of site people as well that I've met with. Before, there was always this kind of notion that whenever the site guys were there, when they come to the studio, that this, the people in the studio are kind of like these high, stuck-up design snobs who know nothing about what happens on site. And then the site engineers are kind of like these crummy, low-life kind of architects that end up on site. And the entire dynamic changed because now everyone realized that if it wasn't for the project on site, we'd be so much more worse off at the moment. I mean, which was quite cool to see, I must say. It was a, it was a pleasant surprise. The, the thing is, out here, it's a very specialized, as you said, a very specialized character who usually works right. on site. Right. And it's, it's quite a disconnect between the studio and site. And this right. is something that I didn't understand when I first came out here because I worked on site when I was back home in Germany and I had to do several internships throughout my university time where you have to prove that you did time. And I actually physically had to work on site as a construction worker for three months. This was part of my curriculum. And I think this is something where I learned the most because it's actual physical labor where you understand what others have drawn up. And this is where you understand sometimes why builders or uh, people on site, they look at the guys in the studio and think, really, it doesn't work like that. And yeah. I think this is where there is a big disconnect in this country where a lot of the designers that never had exposure to site don't really understand that whatever they're drawing up doesn't actually work. Or it's too complicated. It's right. too too much detail that is not needed. And right. I think that this is something that we have been working on for the past five years is trying to fine tune our design work with the feedback that we're getting from site. So lessons learned. What should we do differently? What drawing is actually necessary? What details do we really need? What are the stuff that the contractor really produces a shop drawing of? And other things that are just there, but they don't have any relevance to the project. So right. I think these are things that take time, and but it's really important. And so we have a, one person, Jason, in the office. He's our in-between guy between all the sides and the office. And right. then because also I think this is something that happened over the past few years that whenever there was a bit of downturn in the studio, we managed to get some of the guys exposure at site because there were more people needed for various projects. So I think there a lot of the guys in the office actually had ample exposure to site projects in the past five years. And it's so invaluable, the knowledge that they bring back and the things they can teach to the, the younger staff. And it's something that I think it's not perfected yet, but at least we're doing it and it's getting better every year. And I think it's part of the goals that I set myself and for the business, you know, of course, we want to have a successful year when it comes to project and revenue and profit. But for me, one of the really elemental things is I want to have a better product every year. I want to have a better set of drawings. I want to have a better design. I want it more efficient. I want it less of a headache. And I think this is something that is also a never ending process, but I can see that it has improved over the past five years. And this is right. something that is part of, I think, every year's resolution for, for RSP is, you know, this year we want to, we want to create a better package. Right. I think, so then someone like Jason, who's kind of like this in between the studio and the site, I'm sure that doesn't just apply to drawings per se i would think that that also feeds into things like your contractual documents and your actual you know correct, correct. those those kind Specifications, of specifications well. exactly definitely everything that has to do with contractual i think this is really important looking forward for other projects and then but also it's the fine tuning of what personnel is really required on site i mean you know every time we bid for a project and we have to bid for a construction element of the project you have to already give a manning schedule with different designations of people. Right. And I think, you know, the more you have exposure on site, the better you know what kind of people do we actually need and the profile of these people and the experience that they have to have. Yeah. And it's because it's a it's a beast of its own. Site duration and what is happening there, it's it's real. It's it's different than a 3D model and a room full of drawings. Right. Things are getting built, decisions have to be made, and every every decision costs money. And right. I think this is where you really need the right team um, right. to to be successful. A common a common misconception is that a lot of 
site architects have is that they should just know architecture, which anyone who's been on site will know that. In fact, if, 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 if you don't know any architects, that's probably a good thing. In fact, if you know more about structural systems and efficiencies and how rebar is put together and, you know, MEP systems, for example, and, you know, all the intricacies that come with disciplines that feed into architecture, I think that's what's more important. Is that something which you sort of agree with? I agree, but it's also for... It, it doesn't matter if it's site or, or office. I think that is the first big lesson I learned when I started to work as an architect is that even though architectural field is such a huge array of, of different elements like philosophy and psychology and, and there is art in there and then there is engineering and there is physics and chemistry and everything is in there. But what you really learn once you are in the profession is that, and this is something that they didn't really teach you at university, is that you need to coordinate. You know, you're one element of many, many elements. And, right. and if you don't know how to speak to the other guy and understand what he's doing, nothing will ever get done. And I think the, the, the longer you work at it, you realize that you are the conductor of a big orchestra. And there are all these disciplines. Like, for example, when we do a hospitality project, you have maybe 19, 20 different disciplines working alongside you. Right. But you are the one who has to coordinate all of them, bring them around the table, make sure that they all work in sync. And they all have their little lingo and the different uh, terminology terminologies. Inside, yeah. And you have to learn all of that. And this is where I think the job really becomes interesting is years of experience. You start to understand what all of these guys are, or, or uh, people are contributing and how a project comes together from the first scribble on a napkin to a built building. And there's a long way between that and a lot of coordination that needs to take place. And this is the same on site. I mean, if you don't know anything about structure or MEP, good luck, you know, it's, it's going to be a nightmare for you. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, you need to look, know about architecture, but you really need to start learning about all the other disciplines, especially structure MEP, especially since this is the majority of the building. And I'll never forget this. It must have been about 10 years ago. And we were bidding for a project which was already a built building. It's supposed to be a reuse into from an office into a hotel. And we were trying to convince the client that he needs an architect to do that. And he said, no, I don't need it. I have an interior designer. I have a structural guy and an MEP guy. And all you guys are doing is anyway is the facade. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? He said, the architects, all you do is the facade. I said, okay, well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then it took us three months to convince him that he can't just do it with various disciplines. And I think also the people that he chose and selected already convinced him as well that it's good to have somebody that coordinates everybody. Because this is also something that I realized that all of these disciplines, they need somebody to, I think a nice word is to uh, motivate them to coordinate with each other. It's not incentivize them. <laughs> yeah, it's not the in their nature always. Yeah. And I think that it's really, for me, one of the interesting elements that I learned in this profession over all these years is sitting in big coordination meetings and finally being at, in a position where I kind of understand what people are talking about. Right. And I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in mechanical or electrical engineering, but or structural engineering, but I understand the basics and I think I understand enough to know what they're talking about and what the things is that you need to look out for and that are important. And I think this is also the, the compromise that architecture has to do is to understand the constraints of engineering and then how you can implement that into your design. Right. Agreed. hundred percent. I think, I mean, we were just talking about this before the episode started that probably architectural education needs to sort of, we're well not ramp up per se, but kind of be a little more cognizant of all these sort of intricacies that are there in actual practice, especially on site and so on. I sort of want to pivot a bit into the business side of things again, like the previous project you were talking about, about hospitality work and retail work, even for that matter, two industries which have been severely altered, whatever, because of COVID. Retail was kind of already in this sort of dangerous space with e-commerce and so on brick and mortar stores that is not the actual business and uh, hospitality now with covid is again sort of you know rethinking 
do we actually need XYZ rooms and finishes and so on? So from your point of view, from, you know, sort of RSP's global outlook all over the world with all of your offices, do you see these two industries sort of changing or having different requirements over the next couple of years? I'll start with retail before yeah. we go to hospitality. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're right. I, I think that the traditional brick and mortar retail has missed the opportunity to integrate themselves with e-commerce much earlier. Yeah. I think it was it was out there. It was visible, but they were kind of in denial. And I was just reading an article yesterday of even the big uh, fashion Houses like Zara and H&M, they're now closing a lot of stores yeah. and they're shifting and investing a lot of money into e-commerce. And and I think it's probably six, seven years too late, but at least they're doing it now. And it will change, uh, I think, how malls, but mostly high streets will look like in the next few years. And I think for me, retail here was always a phenomenon because shopping mall is what you see in other parts of the world, almost like a community center. Right. It's a meeting space. It's, right. uh, it's, it's not only about retail. It's about having Friday lunch with your family. It's about these kind of interactions that you don't see necessarily in other parts of the world. I think it has to do maybe the climate here that you know in summer it's nice to be in the mall and and walk around for an hour and and not be really sweaty right so i think that works but also i think that the big malls here they're really well done in the way that it's a mixture of entertainment f and b and retail and i think that this is something that will shift maybe more into the entertainment sector or arm of it and maybe less the retail and i think food plays a really important part in this part of the world and i think this is why uh, some malls have added additions and added more fnb and you know when i came out here 15 years ago nobody wanted to sit outside for a meal there was almost no alfresco dining Right. Or a coffee shop with outdoor seating. But now, you know, it, that's the big thing. It's a big lifestyle. And now every client, how can I make it agreeable that people sit longer in the summer outside? What right. can I do so that we can capture those people that are coming into town and that they're enjoying it for a much longer time? So I think that I think brick and mortar has its it, it still has its validity here. But I think that they kind of went a bit crazy in the amount of malls they're building. I mean, look at what is still not even open yet, but all the, the big ones that are already there, but there is some huge one yeah, in yeah. the pipeline. Absolutely. And then you question, how is that going to work? I mean, already, I think Dubai Mall and Mall of the Emirates, you know, they have become major really, anchors for the city. They work really well yeah. and they're really well done. And the offering that they have is something for everybody, basically. Right. It's like you're a, Cineplex, it has something for everyone, basically. Yeah, and you can, I mean, you can spend a day at like Dubai Mall, like absolutely. breakfast, lunch, dinner, absolutely. everything in between. And I think a lot of people that <laughs> don't know the mall so well, they get so lost that they have to spend a day because <laughs> <laughs> it's not the, the easiest thing to navigate if you of don't course, know your way course. around. But I think, and I, I really like community malls. I think this is what I like, where I like to go shopping and spend a bit of time and, and grab a coffee and, and do things that I need to do. And I mean, we're very lucky with our office in, in the marina. We are right next to Marina Mall. And I think that's a good size mall. It has pretty much everything that you need. And it has some really nice F&B offering with Paris outside right. Pier 7, which is a nice addition to the Marina. Right. So I think that's a really nice kind of mall. And I think coming back to your original question, I think that it has to change the way that business is done in, in a shop. And I think it will be much more experiential. It's, it's much more about the duality of you physically touch something, but you actually order it online. And I think right. this has to be done in such a nice way that it doesn't matter if you sell something in the shop, but as long as the person then on the way out presses the button and orders it online, I think that's fine. And I think this is where we need to come in a way. And our office in Beijing, they have done a really interesting project lately, which is called Kirin Place. Okay. And it's a, it's a basement kind of project which is i think very challenging for retail psychologically you have to go down and you're in like a dark place 
but it's it's split into three zones and one zone is it's almost like a timeout market but for bars so okay. you come into this big space and there are 25 different bars but it's one common space right and then there's a dj and and there's a dance floor and and it's very interesting from this perspective right. for younger people so the whole target is young people to go there have a good time and then you have a big section where they build these prefabricated metal cages that you can rent as a retail space, as a pop-up. So you come, you rent it for three months, for example, and right. you can, in this space, you can hang whatever you have to sell. It's very popular because it doesn't cost very much and it's almost like a bit of this Asian market right. feel to it, but designed really nicely. And then... The third part is a real fun element where you can hire a photographer, you can hire a DJ and you have your own fashion show. So there is like a catwalk with changing rooms and you can sit down and you can have a party, a fashion party. And then it's, you know, you get, I don't want to drop any names, but they're like a fashion brand and they come in and they bring some stuff and you have a party with your friends and, and then you have great Instagram afternoon because they take all these nice pictures of you. And at the same time, they hope, of course, that you can go online and buy the stuff that you already wear and present right. it and right. that people like. Right. And I think that's the kind of future I can envision myself of retail. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned. I like to go in a shop and, and touch something that I'm going to buy, and especially shoes. I need to try them on first and I don't order six sizes and send five back because I think that makes no sense. But I still like to go to a shop. But I understand other people, they they rather go and find maybe the least expensive option on the net and then they order it. It's also fine. But I think that there is always a kind of necessity that you still have a physical presence. Maybe you don't have that much of stock anymore. Maybe that's not necessary. You don't need right. warehouses full of things in, in your shop. An actual presence of some. I think so. I think so. Because you still it's still about the brand. It's still about kind of the association that you have yourself with this brand that makes you right. want to purchase whatever they are selling. And I think that this is something that I think will happen in the next few years where some of these malls will go more into this experiential retail experience. And there will be more entertainment and food and, and whatever else comes with it. And I think that will work for a lot of the shopping malls here or, or brick and mortar areas. But I think some will struggle. I think some right. will have to think about reuse. How can we turn this into something else and you know a lot of the department stores in in europe are being converted into housing because there's a shortage especially inner city living so there's these big programs that are happening at the moment where they are turned into offices or whatever is needed really and i think that this is something where we it's a little bit different out here i think we don't have shortage in either office space or residential areas but maybe in something else so i think this is something that will come also in the next few years that we have to come up with some clever concepts of how can we convert some of these maybe not so successful areas into something new. Right. I think a good example of that would be the drive-in at Mall the Emirates, the sort of, you know, the parking lot right underneath the uh, ski slope. Yeah. It's now sort of a drive-in cinema. That's, yeah. I mean, not ideal, but I mean, it's a good example of how you can sort of repurpose a space. Absolutely. From, Absolutely. from a mall point of view. Yeah. Pivoting a bit into hospitality, there seems to be a trend now in this sector, which is you have a lot of, I mean, of course, you have the big operators who are still sort of, you know, doing their thing with 100 plus keys and so on. But there's also a lot of smaller developers who are sort of offering these, you know, 10 key, 20 key sort of boutique hotel experiences. Do you think from the way things are going with COVID at the moment, do you think that both models need to change or maybe only one or maybe neither? I think that the whole tourism industry has been really hit hard with right. COVID. And I think it will take a bit of time before that confidence is back, that people want to go back on, on a plane and, and stay in a hotel. And is it the right place? Is it a safe place? So I think that this is probably one of the industries that has to reinvent itself the most at the moment, I think. Right. Because it's still, you have to touch a lot of things, you know, right. in, in a hotel. Yes. And to have people have the confidence that this is a safe uh, environment, I think that's number one. And 
But then on the other hand, you know that everybody's itching to travel again. I mean, it, myself as well. You know, I haven't been out. I raise my hand <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been out of the country for a year, and my wife and I we are always thinking where we're going to go first. Where's the first destination that we're going to go with the kids, and what can we do? And so I think that it's it's basically a, a industry that is a bit of on hold at the moment. Right. I don't think it will change so much. I think that it will change for the better in terms of hygiene and maybe less touch points. And finally, we're getting rid of buffets. So I think there's a lot of good things that will come out of this. And I think that the Dubai tourism numbers will bounce back in a few years time. And I think that all owners and operators should take the opportunity now to renovate their premises and get ready for the next big splurge of people coming into town. So I think that this is the time at the moment to invest. This is the time to upgrade some of your facilities and look at it from a traveler perspective. You know, what is important for somebody who is traveling at the moment? How do they want to have their check-in? How do they want to have their room? How do they want to have their meals? And do they want to use the facilities and the amenities? And I think that this is where they have to look at. And I think there's a place for the small boutique hotel, which I always like better than the big 800 key hotels. And I'm interested to see a little bit more of that here in town as well. I think it's about time that we get that. But I think that it's a bit of a holding pattern for the industry at the moment. And I think they should use it wisely. Uh, to, and to rethink a little bit of, you know, it's been such a successful industry for so many years. Every year, the numbers went up. More and more people came. Dubai is a very attractive spot, not only for business, but also for people to come for leisure and, and spending time here in town for, you know, a lot of Europeans come for a week during the winter time to basically defrost a bit, uh, right? <laughs> have a good time out here and and... I think that all of this will still happen in the future. Right. And I think that it's just for them a really tough time to get to that point where their confidence is back. I do have a bit of confidence in the industry myself. I was attended in, in an event about two weeks back, building leisure, something, uh, basically talking about hospitality and so on. And they said that given Dubai sort of, you know, leadership and you know proactive approach to the vaccine and so on at the moment it's kind of the place you want to be worldwide there's a lot of people sort of coming in be it good or bad but that is what's happening and a lot of big operators especially their sort of five-star addresses are pretty much at full occupancy which a lot of similar operators in other big cities such as you know the london's and new york's and so on don't have that level of occupancy so I feel in terms of confidence, maybe just for Dubai, that they're probably on the right track to eventually get to where they are. But you made an interesting point about preparing for that next big splurge. And I know this may be a bit controversial, but I kind of want to get your opinion on it. Do you think that next big splurge is the Expo? I'm really looking forward to Expo. And I, I mean, of course, as designers, we all are. Yeah. I mean, of course. And I hope that there will be oh. enough people able to come visit right. physically but looking at where we are now mid-february it's eight months to go on a global scale i don't think it will be the same as everybody envisioned in terms of success of people coming to town right i i still think that there will that things will pick up by that time in terms of more people getting vaccinated around the globe and you know Emirates Airlines being able to fly in people and there will be con more confidence than today. But I think it will not be as crowded maybe as people right. were thinking right. it will be. And I, I remember I was in 2000, I was in Hanover at Expo. And I remember all the big, amazing pavilions. There was a waiting time of four to six hours to get in. Oh. And um, never really thought of that. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is, I think, something that probably we won't see at Expo because of social distancing. And, you know, you want to make sure there's a more seamless transition and people move around. 
And maybe it's a good thing as well that it isn't so overcrowded. And I think they already started that a lot of things will also be online, a lot of the events, right. which I think is a great idea. And I know that, you know, the, the, the leadership they do in this country, they do everything to make this a successful event and, and as safe as possible. And I, I, I assume it will be, and I, I know it will be, but I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I, I don't know what will happen by then, but it could very well be that there will be a lot of domestic people going and maybe from the region. I don't know if there's going to be so many international travelers by then, because, you know, not every country is as fortunate as the UAE, where there is such a big rollout of vaccination. A lot of other countries are still waiting. They, they have just ordered or nothing has been delivered yet. And, you know, it's a long process for countries that have much more inhabitants than, than the UAE, where it will take a much longer time to vaccinate two thirds of the population or more. Right. So I think it will be very successful, but I think it will be not quite as crowded as they probably assumed it will. Okay. Do you then think, because I mean, I'm not really sure the level of involvement that RSP as a firm would have in the overall expo, but then do you think if that's the case, that the whole sort of expo legacy, which is another thing which sort of the leadership is pushing here, saying that it's not going to be just, you know, the six months of expo, but then the entire site's going to become this sort of, you know, icon for so many other things that can happen. So do you think the legacy part of it is then going to be of a lot more emphasis now because the actual expo won't really sort of have the footfall that is expected? Um, before I go into this, I just want to mention that we are very proud and very happy that we are a little bit at least part of Expo because we we have done two really nice projects there. Right. We have done the fit out of the Rove Hotel, which uh, was in the news just lately. We have done the full interior is that, package. Is that the one that's at the um, at the Wassel? At the uh, Dome. At the exactly. Dome. It's connected to the Dome. So it's the first time that you can actually stay within the, the exhibition. Yeah. Okay. You know, when uh, every other expo that has happened so far, you would stay in a hotel close right. to the exhibition, but you wouldn't actually stay within. Right. So you can actually, from your room, you can see the performance inside the Dome, which is really exceptional. That's cool. And it's a, it's a really nice project, and I can only recommend everyone to go visit it. And, uh, we, shall. Look. we shall. We shall. We'll definitely do an episode from that as well. Very good. <laughs> and the other project is, it's not quite as glamorous, but I think it's very important is we have done uh, numerous uh, operational pavilions that are sprinkled throughout the site and that um, have like little convenience shops, first aid, uh, some washrooms, you know, like things that you need to have the thing operational. So we did that and they are almost complete as well. Um, so very proud of being part of Expo. And coming to the legacy, I think that's the hardest part for any of the huge, large global events that you do. If it's Olympics or World Cup or Expo, it's always what's going to happen afterwards with the things that you build. And I think that they, that they have a really good plan because they thought about it before. So a lot of the pavilions, they will be disassembled and will be shipped back to the countries or there's a big emphasis on sustainability, which I think makes a lot of sense and it's very important. And then I think what is also really good is the location, I think is very interesting. And you will have the big coex, the exhibition center out there, at least part of it. And so I think that move will slowly start to happen from its current location out to, to Expo. And then, of course, once Maktoum Airport will be a little bit more busy than it is at the moment, I think that the location is great. You're right there at a large airport connected with the metro to the city. You have great facilities that they're building now. And I think it's going to be a very interesting cluster of buildings that remain. And I think this is why they have this transition period between the expo and the legacy. I think it's six months uh, that they that they were announcing, and in that time, things will be taken away. Right. And I think it will be then fit to purpose for the legacy time. And I think this is I think it's the right thing to do to try to attract maybe startups, different types of companies to set up shop there. I know that Siemens wants, Siemens wants to put their regional headquarters out there. I think they already leased a big 
piece of office space out there. Would make a lot of sense that they did. Yeah. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's what this part of town, it's a great location. I think this is also what people forget is that Dubai is very widespread. And and yep. for some people that live in the marina, it's much easier to work there than maybe work in Dera, for example. So I think, you know, think about commute times and and it's all new facilities and you have the metro. I think it yep. can really work. It's just about getting people to come set up shop. I think they have their ideas how to do it. Right. I think it will be successful. Okay. Awesome. So that's that's sort of very similar to the view that I had as well, to be honest, that maybe the actual exhibition wouldn't really be, you know, where it where everyone thought it would be. But I think that I do have very high hopes for the legacy part of it. I mean, honestly speaking, I kind of now want to pivot a bit into the last segment of this episode, which is education. You have been part of the education scene for quite a while now, myself included. <laughs> I kind of want to get your opinion on a few things. So we were talking before the show started about how curriculum is an important factor and how it maybe needs to still be refined and tailored to match expectations of, you know, employers like yourself for these new graduates that kind of come out of school. In addition to curriculum, because you are both on ground in practice and you are a professor as well. You actually teach as well. I know there's a lot that can be done, but if you could implement one thing tomorrow in any subject across any year, what would be the one thing that you would want to absolutely have happen? Internships okay. frequently through all five years of your curriculum. Okay. Every year you have to have practical experience in an office, but this goes back to also all the practices. I think that it is not yet common to take on interns. And I think that this is something that goes both ways. We as the industry have to be more open for students and the right. students have to be more open to go and work. Is it? So I think it's not, I don't want to blame only ac academia and the universities. I also blame myself and the rest of the industry. We have to be more embracing young students and giving them an opportunity. I mean, this is just a question out there, but do you think interns are seen as liabilities to companies. And is that why there's resistance? Like, what would be the reason why a company would not want to have multiple interns throughout the entire year? What's the inconvenience? I think that because it's not normal, it's not a given, it's not part of your business setup, right. that I think most companies don't know what to do with interns. And then they come for six weeks, three months. What can we do in three months? I need somebody then to sit with this intern and teach him something. What am I going to get out of it? That's, right. I think, what a lot of people think. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of my investment. What, what am I going to get out of it? So I think that there needs to be a normalization of having interns frequently and give them opportunities. And the thing was for me, when I was at, at university, I knew that it could actually get me a job later. If right. I come frequently and work at the same company over and over again, they know me and they would be then really stupid not to hire me at the end of the day because I'm already part of the, the company. You know? There is no training, you know, the systems, exactly. you know, the people. Exactly. So I think that this is something where there needs to be a bit more openness to this kind of collaboration. And right. the thing is what, you know, amazes me every time I, I am at the university here is how good the kids are with the softwares, for example. You know, they are really up to date and they do stuff that, you know, we don't really do in the office all the time. When it comes to parametrics and Rhino and Grasshopper, and there's some really interesting stuff going on. And I think that a lot of companies don't see that potential that they could bring in right. and the creativity and and I think that this is something where, as I said, there needs to be a dialogue and there needs to be opportunities. And if every company would open their doors to give students the opportunity, then I think this would be a much more successful symbiosis. And I think that's at the moment not really happening because if I have a student that has five years of school just finalized, and then they do their first internship. You're kind of already set in your ways, in a sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I always tell students that the number one thing I expect from you, you have to be able to design. You're going to school for five years. 
the one thing I'm not going to teach you anymore is design, because this is why I'm going to hire you. So if you can't, if you can't design, then you know I don't know what you did for the last five years. Right. What I'm going to teach you is how to use your design skills and how to learn the coordination element what we talked about earlier and all the other things that you need to understand. Right. Time management. You know, as a student, you always have time. <laughs> and you do it for the last week and then you don't sleep for a week. Sure. We, we don't want to do that at work because I want to do the four day week. But then we need to work really efficient and smart. So yeah. I think that these are things that I can teach you when you come out of school. But you need to be able to design and you need to have a good foundation of architecture and understand the basics. And the more exposure you had throughout your career at university, working and exposing yourself into the real work life, the better it is because the easier it is for me to give you tasks. And the thing is, you know, we take every year, we take at least one or two graduates and, and hire them. And I think we had some really good success rates with that and some amazing people that are still with us and they grew and, and learned a lot of amazing stuff throughout the years. And it takes at least a year. Of course, absolutely. And it's, it's a lot of time investment, but it's so worth it. And it's a lot of fun and it's great to see them excel. And it's something that we're very proud of, but it's only two people. You know, it's not a big number. And there's a lot of people graduating each year. And I feel very bad for a lot of them because it's so difficult to get a job. And now the pandemic is even, even tougher. Right. You know, I get contacted by a lot of young graduates and they're very desperate. They're very frustrated. They're very... Rightly so. I mean... And I totally yeah. understand. And I always tell them, you know, it's, it's a very challenging time to get through, but don't lose hope. Don't lose your dream and your vision. If this is what you really want to do, just believe in it. And it took me years to find my first real job. And I, I know what they are going through and the rejection of applications and all the frustration that comes with it. but it's so worth waiting and finding that first opportunity after a while. And right. at the meantime, you know, use the time wisely and try to educate yourself as much as possible and, and sketch and design and, and learn new software skills. And, you know, travel is out of the question at the moment and go to, you can't go to, to Rome and look at old ruins, but, you know, try to maybe do virtual travel and and try to learn from the masters and this is also something i always told every student that i had the pleasure of teaching so far is you know you you, you got to learn where we're coming from right. in terms of architecture you have to know the past and you have to learn from them and know why they are considered masters of architecture and yeah. design and you need to know their buildings by heart and you have to build a physical model of Le Corbusier's building to understand why he is one of the masters. And I think that there's so many things you can do while you wait. And of course, it's frustrating, but I think that the market will pick up at one point and we can rehire or start hiring people again. So all this will come. But I think coming back to your question, for me, it's, it's really work experience for students throughout their ac academic life to understand a little bit better also what they're facing because, you know, you learn for five years and you don't really know what you're getting into. Maybe, right. you're not, maybe you don't like it. Maybe it's not for you. Right. And then you wasted five years. I think it's, it's, it should also be your curiosity to find out as quickly as possible is this really what I want to do or not? Because it's a lot of money and you could invest that into something completely different. Agreed. And Absolutely. also, and I hate to say this, but not everybody is made to be an architect. Not everybody is actually born to do this. And it is a lifestyle. <laughs> it is a lifestyle. And I will never forget this. And I, I, I was sitting in my very, very first lecture at university and we were in this big auditorium with 160 people in that as graduating or this first year. And my professor came in and he said, half of you will not graduate. Yeah. I think half of you should go home right now. And then we all looked at each other and we didn't want to be that 50%. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, nobody got up, nobody left. But it, right. it was after the first year already, we were 50% less. Because a lot of people realized this is actually not for me. Yeah, 
I didn't, uh, no one really told us that, but we sort of saw exactly that happen. I think we started off as a batch of 120, 130, and I was one of 18 or 20 that graduated. Wow. I mean, granted, it was, you know, the first batch and whatnot, but still, I mean, at the time, I thought that was shocking. But then when I met other graduates, they sort of said, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that bad, but it is a one in three, one in five kind of like ratio. Which, yeah, I mean, if, if only students knew that <laughs> kind of before going in. Yeah. But ha- having said that, having said that, it probably is in your best interest to sort of get out at first year and find something that you really want to do. Correct. As compared to, you know, just, you know, tipping over the passing mark for five years and then entering a field which is going to be even more brutal than what, you know, university was. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I agree completely. There is a question that I wanted to ask you. It, w- it was actually brought up by a colleague of mine because he keeps saying that, oh, you always ask your guests about, you know, students and graduates and everything. We exist too. And by we, he meant sort of the mid-level people, I guess, like myself as well, who've been maybe, you know, eight to 10 years in the industry and so on. So I guess it's an appropriate question to ask you. What are the kind of skill sets which a designer, be it architecture, interior, whatever it is, a designer would need to sort of enter management, become a director, become an associate, become partner in a firm or whatever it may be. What are the kind of skill sets which are then needed for a role like that? I think for me, the, one of the fundamental things that somebody like yourself needs to have to do the next step is, of course, talent, no doubt, a drive to be successful and ambitious. But for me, what's really important is the ability of strategic thinking. It's that you have a sense that you can think beyond the task that you do every day. You have to start thinking about the business, how to be promoting the company, how to engage with your clients in a level where you feel like you can bring in another job because of personal relationships that you form. But also to have the ability to think in the bigger picture because a lot of people are really good at that what they do they're specialists in certain tasks but they feel very uncomfortable to do something that is not related to their core ability and i think you realize very quickly when you work with people on a daily basis who has these kind of skill sets that they can think about a lot of things at the same time. And I think this is what we're looking for when it comes to promoting people to the next level and forming them into a stream where they can be part of the management at the future stage. Because the things that you need to do at the later stage, it is becoming more complex, but also more boring. Because you're getting out of your pure design element, for example, and then suddenly you have to do managerial things which are not really that much fun. You know, it's a lot of emails and stuff like that. It's it's a lot of things that you actually don't want to spend your time with. It's it's a lot of meetings, it's HR, it's it's legal, it's business, it's finance, it's all the things that are not fun because you're an architect, you want to design, you want to doodle around, you want to think about creative processes, but you don't want to think about fees and late payments and... You know, things that just are a headache and a lot of emails, as you said. Right. But these are all the things that will be part of your daily business. And then, you know, like myself, for example, I have to do a lot of business development. I have to connect with people. I have to talk to them. I have to convince them with all the other architects in town that do the project with us. Right. Because we are are more fun. (laughs) And I think we are. And... um, and of course, we are very talented, but, you know, when you come to a certain level, it's, it's unfortunately, in there's a part, lot of talented people here. There are so many talented people and there's so many good architects in, in, in this, in the city. And, you know, there's so many really good competitors out there. And, right. and I really have to say that. And um, so it's, it's, it's very challenging, I think, for a client to choose the right partner in a project. And unfortunately... Very often, the decision is made by the financial part of it. So I'll choose the cheapest one. And I think that this is where our industry fails. 
because we we don't understand that we are killing out each other right. by underbidding each other all kind the of the race to the bottom who can kind of undercut who at what price exactly. yeah exactly and architecture has become a commodity it's you know the cheapest thing sells but what is the client really getting for that so the client doesn't understand if i only go by price maybe the product that i'm getting is not the best right like you know no client would go to a mercedes dealership and say give me the s class but you give know what discount <laughs> i actually i'm just going to pay 50000 for it right because i saw an accord that had that price exactly. tag yeah. yeah so not that we don't like accords or s classes i'm just just want to put that out there we love them both <laughs> yes and i can just you know tell a little anecdote when my father was telling me when he opened this office in the 1960s he he would have a introduction meeting with a client and let's say it's an hour discussion and he would go home and he would bill him for an hour of consultation like a doctor or a lawyer or you know which still bill Happens. you by the hour yeah and now concept for free you know this seems to be the new the normal yep. and i think that this is something where we completely lost what we're doing right and this is has a knock on effect to everything like what we talked about hiring interns getting students graduates in because it's suddenly the business model is very different and you know the the profit margins in our industry have shrunk so much the raise it in now yeah if you are able to come out without a loss out of a project it's already good right and i think that this already tells a lot and i think we we should really start rethinking how we do our business and i think we need to have an open discussion with everybody in the industry that the way we're doing it it's not sustainable and i think it's needed that kind of open dialogue and i right. think nobody wants to talk about it and everybody is just trying to scrape through right and but i think now in a time where it's not so busy and people actually have time to think these are things that i would like to see for 2021 is an open dialogue in the industry how can we do this together because also what it's really obvious is there is very little dialogue between clients consultants and contractors right Agreed. it always feels to be a struggle against each other there's a lot of friction between a lot other. of friction and there is a lot of distrust yep. and there is no collaborative approach and at the end of the day we all want the same thing we want a great project and right. yes, we want it on time and we want it in budget. And how do we get there as a team? And I think that this is something that we should learn out of this crisis at the moment is let's be a team again and right. let's not play each other and point fingers at each other because we all need each other to survive and to move forward. But I think we should do it in a much more clever and a much more amicable way. And I think that this should happen this year. Okay. Makes sense. But having said that, yes, it's that's ideal. And yes, if the industry sort of came together, then we can help each other out, no doubt. Isn't it a bit too utopian to think that everyone would sort of come together? Because at the end of the day, business is a business. Everyone wants to, you know, make their own well, money. We're and architects, we're dreamers. <laughs> of course. But do you think there's a more sort of realistic way to make that happen? Because, I mean, for example, it's, it's, it's quite common now to have these, you know, round tables wherein management sort of comes together from different companies. They have a good coffee. They talk for an hour. They share ideas. But then for some reason, it doesn't get implemented. And for some reason, information doesn't really move across companies. It seems that everybody wants to share. Everybody does share. But it doesn't sort of trickle down into the companies where it has to. So I understand why that would happen, especially in much larger companies. I'm assuming that's a lot more difficult to do as compared to like a boutique, for example. But do you think there are realistic steps which can be taken? I mean, ideally, if I were to say, Ralph, you know, whatever you need in terms of funding, resources and so on, you have it. What would be the first thing you would do to sort of get the industry together and have that conversation? I think that's the... The thing that unfortunately very seldom happens is that you bring all the entities together into one room. Okay. Because 
you know, I've been to so many events and I've been invited as a, as a panelist or guest speaker to industry events in the whole region for years and years and years. Right. And very often you feel like it's a nice architectural gathering between your peers and friends. And, you know, you will always talk about the same topics. Because more of a catch up than it does. It is. Yeah. It is. And, you know, it's very relevant topics that we discuss, but I feel like nobody really listens to it because the people that should be hearing this, they're not in the room. Right. And I think that this is something where because of the nature of the market here, I think that there needs to be a way how the government gets involved to a certain degree because a lot of the projects are semi-government or government related. And I think that there has to be a round table involving the authorities, involving people that are in high positions in government organizations or client organizations, and they should be part of this discussion. So it doesn't become an industry related specific specific design forum. Which right. is great. We ha- we need those as well. But if you want to change things, if you want to move forward, I think we need to have a different setup in the room, and right. that people actually understand what the issues are. Because the construction industry is such a big pillar of this economy that we need to ensure it keeps going right. and it keeps keeps growing and it keeps extending and continuing over the next decade and furthermore. And I think that there needs to be a better understanding of all parties involved and how we can work together. I, I, I know it's a, it's a bit naive to think that we're all going to be friends and, and that, you know, it's, we, we, it's, could be. It's, uh, we could be kind of a real collaboration in this sense. But I think if the respect is there and if the understanding is there and if people see how we could resolve it, if that vision would be there, then I think the products that would be built and created in the city would be much better. Because right. if we're really honest, you know, there's very few projects that are really world-class architecture. True. True. There's a lot of stuff that is just in the background yeah. that is built. And a lot of stuff should not have been built. There's a lot of examples all over. Yeah, I know exactly what you're, t- what you're talking about. Even though it always amazes me of how much is built. I mean, you know, you have to give yeah. it to Dubai and, and to the leadership. What they have created here is, is mind-boggling. It's, it's really incredible, the achievements. But through that process of the speedy delivery of so many projects, a lot of times design and quality has been overlooked and pushed aside for speed of delivery. And I think that this is something where moving forward, I would like to see more good design in a slower pace, right. if possible. This is something which I've sort of been thinking about as well. Not so much the slower design part, but again, a little more, maybe a naive sort of optimistic look to the overall industry. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Do you think that if every sort of design practice focused on what they as a practice were really, really good at. Do you think there's enough sort of work, for lack of a better word, wherein everyone can sort of do their own thing without getting in each other's way? I think the competition is too big now. I okay. think I think it was possible before, but I think there's too many players in the market now that this will not happen. I think maybe there's a cleansing effect now through the crisis that some people will leave, some offices will close, unfortunately, yeah. but this might be also part of the solution. But I think that there is too much competition that we can all happily survive here. Right. And I think moving forward, we talked about sustainability a little bit earlier. And I think that this is something that I would like to see is for the next decade, that for the 2030 vision of this country, I think we should really rethink of how we build. And I think being in a global society where we realize how important the planet is for all of us and how much in danger it is. I think moving forward, I think we need to be more conscious of the environment and we have to be more sustainable in the way we build. And this is something that I still don't see because fundamentally, if you look at any construction site, it's still the way we built almost a hundred years ago. 
nothing has sure. really advanced. Okay, we built higher and we built quicker, but, but the fundamentals are still the sort of fundamentals are still the same. And is this the best way we can do it? I don't think so. I think we can do better. And you know, our resources are getting less and less. And right. we need to we need to embrace this and we need to tackle it. And we need as an industry to talk about this. Right. And I think that better design, more sustainable design, I think that this is something that I would like to see in the next decade in this town. Right. I mean, talking about sort of, you know, the construction industry and, you know, like you said, things are pretty much the same as they were 100 years ago. As, as a large practice, what are your thoughts on 3D printing, which seem to be, you know, this next hot thing, which everyone's trying to do, have been some pretty good projects, which have implemented it and seems to be, at least from my point of view as a designer, quite a lot of potential. Do you think that we can see something which is 3D printed in, I mean, let's say a high-rise tower, for example, can 3D printing actually sort of get involved into projects like that? Or is it always just going to be at a very small scale? I'm not talking about precast, that's a different story, but actually 3D printing modules on site and kind of doing large scale projects. I think we'll get there, yes. I've been just in touch with a former colleague of mine who decided a few years ago to go back into academia and he did his master's in Zurich at ETH. ETH. Yeah. And he's still there. He's doing his thesis at the moment in robotics and 3D printing. And he was giving me a little glimpse of what they're doing there at the moment. And it's mind boggling. It's unbelievable the stuff that they are doing. And I think it's in a very small scale still because it's still early days. Right. But I, what I could see is there's so much potential moving forward. And we will see it in high rise buildings as well. And the components will be 3D printed. And I think that it will be great for safety on site when we have probably more advanced technology there. And I think it will be much more precise and it will be much less waste of material. I'm really excited about it. And I can't wait to see how this part of the business will advance in the next decade. Right. I think we're still very early days because at the moment, everybody talks about prefab, precast, offsite, modular construction, assembly on site. And I mean... These are things that have been around for a very long time, but they just have not been embraced. And right. I think it's about time that we do more of that. And it's about, I think, about smartness of how we build and how we can save costs and uh, save resources and have, especially for this part of the world, have better insulated buildings. And, you know, we are wasting so much energy on cooling and spend so much money on that. and. A lot of the buildings, they just, you know, seem to all day long have to have AC on in order to stay cool and because they're not insulated right. And I think that these are things that we need to tackle. It's about education as well. So it's about education of clients, of engineers, of architects, of how to do it better. And that's something that's missing in university as well, is to fully understand how important this subject is. Right. Agreed. I think that with people like yourself sort of bringing practice to education a lot more tangibly, I think we need a lot more people like you actually doing that. And like you said, vice versa, if a lot more practices sort of embraced internships at many scales, I think that would that would sort of really bridge the gap. I think that's the first solution I've heard, which is A, actionable, can be done tomorrow if everyone wanted to, and will actually have a significant impact on both sides of the spectrum. So, yeah, I completely agree. I think what's important is also for the student mindset is to be open to have a little bit less leisure time. Right. And I'll never forget this. One of the courses I was teaching, one of the students, she came up to me and said that her work-life balance was in jeopardy because I was giving too much homework for the students. And I looked at her with absolute amazement because I didn't know that there was a work-life balance during <laughs> university <laughs> years. <laughs> and yeah. so I think that this is something where there needs to be 
an openness as well. And I think it's it's you know it's a different culture around here. It's it's a, maybe a different upbringing of a lot of the students. So that I think it needs to be a little bit of shift in perception that this is a good thing. Right. And even, or just or just maybe manage expectations that manage support. expectations absolutely. And I think that everybody will realize that once you did come and work with us for a few months, that it's a fantastic occupation. I mean, it's so interesting to work as an architect or interior designer or as a planner. It's it's a lot of fun, right? But it's maybe a little bit different than how you would perceive it while you are still at university. Right. It's, it is a lot more focused. It is a lot more driven by the client brief than maybe your wild imagination that you had. Right. So I think this is part of managing expectation is also that the creative process has its limit when you work as an architect compared to your university days where you know, anything is possible. Right. And you, you need to be a little more pragmatic about things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think I would never want to limit somebody's creativity and say, oh, this is impossible to build because thanks to 3D printing, we'll come soon to opportunities where we can do things that before were deemed yeah. impossible. Right. So I think that's the exciting part of it. But I think you still need to be somehow realistic of is this something that is within a budget as right. boring as it sounds, but it's a big driver of our profession is the budget of the client right. and very well. So, I mean, it's their money and you need to find the fine line of artistic creativity versus, you know, engineering opportunities and possibilities and constructability at the end of the day. And right. I think this makes for me, that makes a great architect is somebody that knows all of that and combine it and create something incredible that's buildable. I mean, but that's what architects used to be, right? I mean, if we go say a hundred years, 200 years back, I mean, with all due respect to engineers, there weren't many. It was exactly, it, it, it was the architect that did all of that. Exactly. And, and even, I mean, we don't need to go that far behind I mean, Something like the Barcelona Pavilion, architecture, interior, landscape. I mean, product design, everything was an architect. So, And yeah. I think this is where our industry or our profession as an architect, where we have over the past 50, 60 years, where we were stupid enough to give away a big piece of the pie because we used to do all of this. And then we started to be maybe too precious about certain things that we like to do, that we didn't want to do other things. But, you know, when, when my father opened his office, there were no QSs, there were no project managers, there were, all of these things didn't exist at that time. Right. You were the one who's doing all of that. And you said interior design, landscape, everything was done by the architect. And we have given away so much now because we either don't know how to do it anymore or we don't want to do it. And these are things that I find really sad that we are getting pushed into a niche now where a 